This spooky Halloween special is sponsored by the Magic Candle Company. Go to magiccandlecompany.com or the link in the description and use code OFFHAND15 for 15% off your whole purchase for Halloween. It's that spooky time of year where creepy creeps materialize and Halloween, it's upon us. Uh, as you can clearly see, I'm in a very dark room for the spirit of the holidays. And today I wanted to do a very special video for Halloween. Okay. Today's video is all about the haunted mansion. All of the videos that I've released throughout the days, all of the videos I've released, dang it. All of the Haunted Mansion videos I've released throughout the years will be featured in this video, including a few new ones you may not have seen yet. So relax, strap in, and prepare yourself for one of the spookiest offhand Disney videos ever. And today, of course, as always, I am joined by my friend Kermit the Frog. Kermit, where, where's Kermit? I think I may have lost Kermit, so while I look for him, you guys enjoy this first ever Haunted Mansion related video I did on my YouTube channel. It's really fun to make, really fun to put these back into a video and see where I've been throughout the years. I will not be including the 31 Nights of Halloween in this video because those are their own Halloween specials and I think they deserve their own attention and uh, my hand is burning. So everyone enjoy the offhand Disney Halloween Haunted Mansion Supercut. Did you know that in the seance room in the Haunted Mansion, facing opposite of you, Madame Leota has her very own satanic spell book. You wouldn't be able to read it by yourself because it's too dark in there and you wouldn't be able to see the book in the first place, but don't worry, I'll transcribe it for you here today. On the first page, 1312, under the title Memento Mori, there is a picture of Death, the Grim Reaper himself, who bears a little resemblance to Ezra, the tallest and skinniest hitchhiking ghost. The second page is a little harder to decipher, because words are written in Latin. The title of the page reads, A spell to bring to your eyes and ears one who is bound in limbo. Below that is a list of words in a language I can't decipher that read, Cree, Kra, Virgo, Jeba, Kalto, Cree. Finally, below that incantation are the lines we're familiar with Leota saying, such as serpents, spiders, tail of a rat, call on the spirits wherever they're at, etc. This is interesting because the spellbook itself is kind of scary to look at, and you wouldn't think you'd find something on a Disney ride. It looks almost satanic, but there it is. Hey guys, present day offhand Disney here, and I just wanted to say that I do now realize to bring to your eyes and ears one who is bound in limbo is actually a line from the Disney movie Blackbeard's Ghost. The movie actually came out in 1968, one year before the Haunted Mansion opened. So that line at the top is probably just a fun reference to the movie, Blackbeard's Ghost. Kermit? Kermit, buddy, where are you, man? Kermit? Oh, I don't like that at all. Not one bit. Number two, the 1,000th Happy Haunt. Scattering ashes at Disneyland is something you'd be surprised how often happens. Namely, in a ride that's famous for housing people that are already dead. It's very commonplace for relatives to scatter ashes of their loved ones inside the haunted mansion. Disney, on the other hand, does not take too kindly to this, and at the end of the day will vacuum up the ashes like any other dust that's found on the attraction. But this apparently does not stop the restless souls that inhabit the mansion. The crying child is a very famous example of this. You'll usually find him near the exit to the attraction, where he is crying and asking for his mother. Legend has it that his mother spread his ashes inside the mansion, and now he is doomed to haunt the attraction for the rest of eternity. Or at least until they tear it down. One of the two. Hopefully the first one. I really like that right. Another less disturbing haunt in the attraction is one of an old man. Cast members will apparently see him emerge from the exit tunnel where the doom buggies loop back around at the end of the ride. At this point, cast members are expected to remember their training. If they see an old man circle around, they're supposed to let him keep going, and once the doom buggy emerges once again through the exit tunnel, the man will be gone. Today, we are talking about 
the Disneyland Cinematic Universe. Not quite the same thing, but you'll see where I'm going in just a second. Pirates of the Caribbean, The Haunted Mansion, same universe. And how, you ask, are they connected? When you board Pirates of the Caribbean, look up and you'll see a sign. That sign is how The Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean are connected. And what is this sign? What ties these two classic Disney attractions together and places them in the same universe? Lafitte's Landing. And this thing in New Orleans Square. But we'll talk about that later. Big thanks to Long Forgotten Haunted Mansion for coming up with this theory. Let's get into it. Let's talk about that bricked up archway for a second. Along the riverfront of the Rivers of America, in front of the Haunted Mansion, if you look down and to the left, you'll see a sunken, bricked up archway. Above the archway are numbers that spell out the year 1764. Now you're probably asking yourself, what's so important about the year 1764? Well that, my listeners, is when the Sugar Act was passed in Great Britain. What is the Sugar Act? I don't know. But back to the archway? Kevin Yi, he's a mice chat guy I think, claimed that there was originally a plan to unify the two rides in New Orleans Square into one nice cohesive story. And that bricked up archway was originally supposed to lead to a dead pirate's tomb full of treasure underneath the haunted mansion. What pirate? It's Jean Lafitte, like Lafitte's Landing! Oh my- The tomb was to be Jean Lafitte, the Pirate King's tomb underneath the Haunted Mansion, which would tie the two rides, Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion, together. But not only would it tie Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion together, but also Tom Sawyer Island. That's right, the crypt would lead to some sort of pirate's lair on Tom Sawyer Island, eh? Pirate's lair, eh? Oh, but you must be asking, oh, where did they get the number 1764 from? Was it from the British Sugar Act of 1764? No. No, it wasn't. I still don't know what the Sugar Act is. Stop asking. Now, this is the biggest hole in the theory, the biggest plot hole, so, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but it originates from removing 200 years from the birthday of the Imagineer who worked on New Orleans Square, Matt McKim, born in 1964, which, you know, I don't, I don't know why they do that. It's kind of confusing to me, but you know what, moving along. One other reference to Jean Lafitte lies where the Petite Patisserie is now. What did the Petite Patisserie used to be called? Hmm. It's Lafitte's Silver Shop, ladies and gentlemen. It's all coming together. It's all coming together now. It all comes back to the pirate guy. You see, this is all even backed up by an Imagineer, Eddie Soto. He was quite the big boy on campus when it came to Walt Disney Imagineering, but he vouches for this entire theory, so I mean, there's something there. Basically what the plan was, and there's still concept art of this, was you would go to the Haunted Mansion, enter a sort of crypt, and there'd be a bunch of skulls down there, you know, kind of like the Parisian catacombs. You'd keep following that tunnel till you popped up on Tom Sawyer Island, and Fort Wilderness would be replaced with an upturned pirate ship. And all of this would have combined Pirates of the Caribbean, The Haunted Mansion, and Tom Sawyer Island into the Disneyland Cinematic Universe. Or the Disneyland Attraction Universe, you know, whatever. So what I've given you so far are the facts. But the mystery doesn't stop there, the rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper. As you're wandering around the esplanade of New Orleans Square in front of the Rivers of America, perhaps you've noticed a sort of, a uh, anchoring theme. There's an anchor sitting in a, in a flower bed. There's an anchor. And who does that anchor belong to? I will give you one guess. If you guess Jean Lafitte, come on down! You're our lucky winner! It belongs to Jean Lafitte! It just keeps going. That anchor has been around Disneyland since opening day, and the plaque has remained the same ever since. Now, is this some sort of coincidence? Probably, yeah. And now we head back to Tom Sawyer Island, where Pirate's Lair currently resides. Well, I mean, at the time of making this video, it's technically closed because they're building Star Wars Land, but that's besides the point. Now, is this Pirate's Lair some sort of cheap cash-in on the Pirates of the Caribbean film franchise? Definitely, yes. But, remember what I said earlier? Secret tunnels underneath Tom Sawyer Island? Pirates? Skulls? Hidden treasure? Yeah, it's kind of ringing a bell. There is a special place on Tom Sawyer Island where they store things for Phantasmic. A very peculiar place with a very peculiar name. What is the name of the building? Lafitte's Tavern, ladies and gentlemen! It's Jean Lafitte back for another round. Now here's something pretty interesting that we'd all like to forget about. The Haunted Mansion motion picture starring Eddie Murphy. 
Wait, wait, hear, hear me out. Before the movie was released, they put out a backstory to Gracie Manor, the haunted mansion from the movie. Apparently, Captain Ambrose Gracie was a ship trader. He traded with various companies in order to make a living and eventually build a mansion. Now, one of his business partners who helped him earn some money was a certain pirate lord, should I say, who smuggled some goods for him on the side and helped him earn a little extra coin to build the mansion. Now, you're probably asking yourself, who, who is this pirate lord? Who helped him build the mansion? Jean Lafitte! See, the movie is not canon with the ride, so I'm pretty sure this was just an allusion to the fact that all three rides were supposed to be connected at some point. Very interesting, nonetheless. Some more backstory for you. In 2006, DoomBuggies.com premiered an exclusive audio file called Nuptial Doom, which was an elaborate retelling of the original backstory for the Haunted Mansion based on Ken Anderson's old sea captain tale. You remember that one with, like, Captain Gore, and it was supposed to be a walkthrough, and, like, the, the floor would get all wet? That, that's, the, that's the original mansion, that one. All told, by the way, by the voice actor of Constance, the ghost bride in the attic. Also, keep that whole attic thing in mind, we're gonna be going up there pretty soon. In the story, it is mentioned that Captain Gore was an old friend of Jean Lafitte himself. Here's another little connection. Andrew Jackson fought alongside Jean Lafitte during the Battle of New Orleans. You know, they were old comrades, old buddies. And if you stopped by Tom Sawyer Island, you could see Andrew Jackson there. Eventually they took those out, but where did they put the costumes, you ask? Where did they put the costumes of Andrew Jackson, friend of Jean Lafitte from Tom Sawyer Island? Where did they put those costumes? The attic of the Haunted Mansion! They put it inside the Haunted Mansion! Which just further ties together these three attractions. Oh, and did I mention the chair yet? I don't think... No, I did not mention the chair. I'm gonna mention the chair. Take a look at these four images. Interesting, huh? But rewind a couple years. 2006 to be exact. It used to be an old Pirates of the Caribbean stage show with comedy, singing, you know, the whole Disneyland deal. But a part of the set was the old April through December changing portrait from, you guessed it, the Haunted Mansion. Why would they include a Haunted Mansion changing portrait in a Pirates of the Caribbean themed show? Because they're both located in New Orleans Square? Yes. Probably, but put your tinfoil hats on, ladies and gentlemen, get ready. When they removed the original April through December changing portrait, what do you think they replaced it with? Hmm. Hmm. What did they replace it with? I rest my case. Actually, I don't. There's more. No, there's actually not that much more. There's. It's just a newspaper clipping on the board for Pirate Slayer that says that Jean Lafitte used to make Tom Sawyer Island his base. Pretty, pretty cool, I guess. But this all begs the question, was this on purpose? Are they trying to bring back the mega theme of New Orleans Square? No. Honestly, I think they're just reusing props because that's what Disney does. But that isn't to say that they are not paying homage to the original idea of New Orleans Square. One giant unified land where Pirates of the Caribbean, the Haunted Mansion, and Tom Sawyer Island were all part of the same story. Kermit! Where are you, man? Kermit? Today is the day. Today is the day we return to the Disneyland Cinematic Universe. That's right, my friends. Today I am back with another Disneyland theory, and this one is a bit of a doozy. Today I will be presenting to you a theory. A theory so outlandish that some of you just might think I'm talking out of my- as many of you know I have been hinting towards a Haunted Mansion video for a long time now. And while this is a Haunted Mansion video, this is not THE Haunted Mansion video. That's coming later. In this theory, I will be presenting the idea that perhaps, just maybe, the Haunted Mansion and Phantom Manor reside in the same universe. Now I know this sounds a lot like the Pixar theory in those kinds of videos, but believe me when I tell you that the Haunted Mansion and Phantom Manor take place in the same timeline in the same world. 
Now in order to explain this theory, I will need to play some audio clips, but I do not want to get my video copyright flagged, so I will instead link them down in the description below. Just so you guys know, so you're not confused when I tell you to go down into the description and look for video number one. Now I developed this theory when I was in my car driving listening to the Phantom Manor soundtrack, as all Disney fans do, and I found something that sounded a little familiar. Now would be the point of the video where you would go down into the description and watch video number one. Now you only need to listen from about 30 seconds into about a minute 15 seconds a minute 20 seconds into the video listen to it good okay now i don't know about you but that sounded a lot like speaking to me english speaking now i don't understand exactly what they were saying but it sounded sort of like things that ghosts would say while you were riding through the graveyard in the american haunted mansion i will now direct you towards a piece of merchandise the piece of merchandise i'm talking about is madame leota's music box now, I know it does not play the exact same tune when you open it up, but where else do you hear a haunted music box in the Disney parks? Outside Phantom Manor all year round, and outside the Haunted Mansion in California during Haunted Mansion Holiday, but that's not what we're talking about here. A music box is played throughout Phantom Manor, outside and inside, and the only other time we hear about a music box through all other Haunted Mansions is this one that belongs to Madame Leota. And who is the only original Haunted Mansion character that appears in Phantom Manor? Yeah, you guessed it. Madam Leota. Boom. Now I know you might be questioning me. You're saying, hey, that doesn't prove anything, and you're right, it doesn't. But you know what does? Nothing, this is this is all a hunch, but I do have more evidence. You've all heard about the Haunted Mansion movie, right? No, no, not that one. The new one that Guillermo del Toro is going to make. Now Guillermo del Toro has come out and kind of given us a basic plot outline of what the Haunted Mansion movie would be about. Basically, it's a web of haunted houses all over the world that are connected by one person, that are being powered and fueled by this one person or one spirit. Who is that spirit you're asking me? Not Madame Leota, the Hatbox Ghost. The Hatbox Ghost doesn't really appear inside of Phantom Manor, but Wait a minute. Yes, he does. Look at this guy. Look at this ticket taker. Does he look a little familiar to you? That head is the exact same mold that they used for the Hatbox Ghost at Disneyland. A web of haunted mansions around the world connected by the Hatbox Ghost. But wait, where? where's the Hatbox Ghost at Florida? Where's the Hatbox Ghost in Mystic Manor? Boom, picture the Hatbox Ghost in the hallway. When it comes to Mystic Manor though, it's a little bit harder to explain, so you're gonna have to stay with me. I'm gonna be doing a lot of reaching here, reaching really far. Both the Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion were both designed in part by Rolly Crump. Now when Rolly was first coming up with ideas for the Haunted Mansion, he wanted living poles on the side of the stretching room, living columns. And if you don't believe me, here's a piece of concept art. Now these haunted columns look awfully familiar to a certain tiki that I've seen somewhere. Oh yeah, that one. But the Haunted Mansion is not the only attraction that takes inspiration from the tiki room. Mystic Manor also does too. Mystic Manor has an entire tiki... Well, Tiki Room. So there's your connection between the Haunted Mansion and Mystic Manor. Besides, you know, it being a haunted house and everything. Oh, and the beautiful young woman turning into Medusa, dressed in the exact same clothes as the changing portrait of the young woman turning into the Medusa, right next to the busts that follow you around the room. That's not a coincidence, I don't think. So there you have it. Confirmation that all of the haunted mansions and haunted house attractions at the Disney parks are in some way connected to the same timeline. We're talking story-wise here, not like construction timelines, but the story of the attractions in the attractions universe. And I think the idea of the haunted mansion, Phantom Manor, and Mystic Manor all being part of one big story is pretty cool. But that's just a theory, a Disney theory. And remember, a ghost will follow you home. <sighs> so now, Rolly, um, I'm sure a lot of people ask you this question all the time, but do you have any fun, cute, silly, or just small stories about Walt that not a lot of people would know? It goes for about two or three days. <laughs> yeah, I have tons of stories about Walt. You know that. He was one of the sweetest men I've ever met in my life, and a, a true genius. And he was just something very special. He never, he always talked directly to you. He never talked down to you. He was always interested in what you were doing personally. 
<clears throat> so I think he was an absolute love. I just great to love the guy. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm a massive fan of the Haunted Mansion, your work, and with the Museum of the Weird, I'm curious to know, like, what is your favorite piece of the Haunted Mansion today? Your favorite scene, favorite character, anything? Well, my favorite piece is all the illusions. Yale Gracie came up with illusions that were absolutely incredible. And if you took the illusions out of the mansion, it wouldn't be the mansion. So I think the illusions are what the secret was, and I felt very fortunate to work with Yale and help design some of those illusions. It was just great. Right. Now, I know that you worked on the Tower of the Four Winds for the World's Fair and for Small World. Yes. Yes, all right. And so um, you explained your inspiration kind of in that uh, documentary with the pencil clip. Um, what else inspired you while building the Tower of the Four Winds? Well, the little propellers that I had in my office really inspired me. I know there was a fellow in animation that I worked with, and I'd go into his office, and he always had this little stupid propeller going around. And I kept saying to him, <clears throat> how do you do that? And he says, well, it's a secret. And so I knew that there was a clip out of the, out of the uh, pencil. So I probably broke up, I don't know how many pencils and clips trying to get the damn thing to work and I couldn't get it to work. And I kept going back into his office and I said, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? And he said, it's a secret. And this went on for, I guess, about six weeks. And so finally one day he says, I'll tell you what, Rolly, he says, I'll tell, I'll tell you how you, I did it, but first I'll, I'll, I'll send one, I'll sell one to you. I said, good, I'll buy it. I said, how much is this, a penny? So I said, I gave him a penny. And he, he gave me the little propeller. And then he explained to me about how to do it because I had ruined more little clips trying to make them work. And what it was was a ballpoint pen that he would make the dent in. And so therefore the pen would, would, would write a little uh, a circle, I mean, a little thing that was kind of half round. I had been using, uh, God, what have I been using? Oh, nails. And the problem was the propeller would get caught, I mean, the, pens, uh, the uh, pen would get caught in the, in the hard part that you dug out. So anyway, I was thrilled. <clears throat> so I actually, I built one. And I was so proud of it. It was a little uh, cow helicopter. And I had it in my office up on the wall and it was going like crazy. This young kid came in from the art price department and he said, um, How'd you do that, really? And I said, I'll tell you. I'm not going to charge you a penny, I'll tell you. So I told him how to do it. So he went back to his office and he built one. And so he called me, he says, I, I built one of your propellers, really. And I said, fine. Well, when I went in there and saw it, he had made, he'd taken cardboard discs, little soft discs, and glued them to his little propeller. Well, his propeller was bigger than mine, and that didn't set well. <laughs> so I went back, and if you remember some of them in the films there, I filled my whole room with propellers, and it was really great. We had a lot of fun. Very nice. Thank you. A couple more questions. Um, you sculpted the gods and the goddesses outside of the Tiki Room. Um, can you explain how that process was? Because you said you had never sculpted before, so how exactly did you react to having to sculpt for the attraction? Well, it's all magic. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the thing is that um, uh, the fellow who was at the uh, sculptor, Blaine Gibson, helped build an armature to put the clay on. And he taught me how to put the clay on and how, around the armature and everything. And the, the clay we used was plastiline clay, which is a soft base clay. And we were working in this barn out back that was freezing. And I tried to get the clay soft enough to put it on the armature. And I realized that this is stupid. I'm in here freezing with my hands and I can't get the clay soft enough to work with. And it was beautiful out. So I put the, put the little guy in a set of wheels and took him into the parking lot. So the very first piece of sculpture I did, I did in the parking lot. <laughs> and, and you know, it's so funny because I think back at it, people say, oh, you work in the company department for Disney? You must have a north light in a beautiful office. And I said, no, I had a parking lot. <laughs> That's a true story. Mary Blair was a worker um, on It's a Small World. She designed the dolls and stuff. Do you have any stories about working with her with the style of uh, Small World on the outside? Yeah, Mary was a, a, a genius. Uh, she'd been a god. As far as I was concerned, uh, she'd been a legend in Disney Studios for many, many years because she was a stylist. 
She knew color inside out and backwards, and she was a delight. And I'd always loved Mary's work, and luckily I got a chance to work with her, which was incredible. And she and I had a very similar love of the paints. We worked right out of the two. A lot of people that were they had a little black or they had a little white or whatever, and they never had the clue or the clean color. And working with Mary with clean colors was absolutely perfect. So she and I got along beautifully, absolutely beautifully. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So do you have any um, like special um, early? Because early on in Disney, you worked in the animation department. So and you said you animated spots on Lady and the Tramp. I've heard that you also worked on. Or in under no donations, I'm sorry. But you also worked on Lady and the Tramp and Peter Pan, is that correct? So what did you do with those two other movies? What did you work on on the two other movies, Peter Pan and Lady and the Tramp? Well, I was an in in-betweener. I did all the drawings in between the other ones, which is not very exciting. <laughs> you know, that's the thrill of it. But um, I think the one thing I remembered about the uh, spots, I mean, you know, my animator said, well, you're going to do the spots, animate the spots on the puppies. I said, oh, Jesus. So anyway, I got started on it and everything, and I had the right formula to work with, and I worked on it. And I'm not kidding you. Here, that particular scene is probably on the film for maybe, I don't know, a minute and a half or two minutes. It took me six months to do the spots on the puppies. Because you have to, you have to watch, the, you have to know how to put a spot on a puppy, and then when he animates, you, you got to have the spot go with the puppy, and you know you forget that he's all over the place, and so you got to stay right with him. So it was really, it was a, an education. It was unbelievable. <laughs> all right. Well, I believe that is all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Well, everyone, I uh, spent the better part of a day searching for Kermit outside. It got really dark, came back inside. Uh, it's daytime now, but I couldn't find him. And I'm starting to get a little worried, uh, but I'm, I'm keeping my hopes up. I don't know if he's in here somewhere, or if he's hiding, or if he just ran away to go do another YouTube channel, but I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to find him. It's just gonna be a case of looking around some more and seeing if What do you want? No. No, I told you I'm done talking about that. I've, I've made enough videos on that. There's nothing more to talk about. Alright, well, if I see what's inside, will you go away? But I'm holding you to that. It's time to look into the backlog of all my offhand Disney theories. Let's see what we got here. Haunted Mansion, Haunted Mansion, Haunted Mansion, Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion. Okay, well, I guess I'll choose this one. Today we are going to have a Haunted Mansion theory video. Another one. This one I've lovingly decided to call the Haunted Mansion Death Theory. Yeah, I know, this channel has just been a ray of sunshine these past few days. But, I mean, hear me out, give me a chance. This one's not as dark as you would think. I mean, it does have to deal with death, but I mean, come on, it's the Haunted Mansion. And that's the theme of the entire attraction. Now, I was planning on making a video about the story of the Haunted Mansion, you know, the original story with Captain Gore, but I've decided to go a little bit of a different route for this video. I've decided to make a very different video, though, one that focuses mainly on a theory about the story of the Haunted Mansion, one that revolves around all of our favorite characters, the ghost host. Now, you thought I was gonna say the hatbox ghost, weren't you? Well, I'm not, okay? He's taking a back seat in this video because the ghost host is who we're looking at today. Now, most of this theory is built around the ghost host's monologue in the stretching room. You know, the one, everybody knows the one that I'm talking about. Uh, when hinges creak in doorless chambers and str <coughs> Okay. Well, I don't do a great Paul Freeze, but you get the idea. So now I know I've been teasing the theory this whole video, but why don't we actually start talking about it? Now that is a great idea. Let's hop right into this new theory that I dub the Haunted Mansion Death Theory. Where's the thunder? 
There's supposed to be a thunder effect. I think we missed the oh, there it is. There's the, there's the thunder effect. So our whole theory starts in the stretching room where the ghost host greets us and says, when hinges creak in doorless chambers and strange and frightening sounds, yeah, 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 everybody knows this monologue. But the important part we need to listen to is coming up because the ghost host says, and consider this dismaying observation. This chamber has no windows and no doors, which offers you this chilling challenge to find a way out. Well, of course, there's always my way. It's from here where lightning flashes and thunder- Oh, there it is again! Okay. Uh, can we lower the volume on the thunder sound effect, please? Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. It is from here where lightning flashes and thunder booms and we look- Thank you. It is from here where thunder flashes and lightning booms where we look up and see the hanging body of the ghost host. Now this is all a little strange considering he just told us to take his way out and then shows us his dead hanging body. Perhaps he's insinuating something. Maybe the ghost host is trying to tell us that the only way out of the haunted mansion is to die. Now I know you're saying, Dallin, this sounds crazy. No way in a million years would Disney encourage their guests to kill themselves. I'm not saying that. That's you guys saying that. All I'm saying is the only way out of the mansion is to die somehow and become a ghost. Now I know you're all scoffing at me right now. That's crazy. Disney would never put a message like that in their ride. But when you look at the attraction and the story itself, things may start lighting up that you've never really noticed before. Anyways, let's continue the theory. On from the stretching room, you exit into the Hall of Portraits. Now, I'll be referring to the Disneyland version of the mansion for this video, but this theory actually works with every single mansion across the entire world, except for Phantom Manor, obviously, because that's its own thing. But every single haunted mansion kind of follows this whole story arc, so stick with me here. From here, you enter your doom buggy and proceed through the mansion. Every ghost you encounter from here on out is disembodied. You don't actually see the spirit. Well, sure, you might see a candle floating down a hallway there, or you might see a door knocking on itself over here, but none of the ghosts you see are actually visible to you. Now, that floating candle might be cool, but you don't know who is holding it. Who is holding that floating candle? Disney, you have some explaining to do. When you go through the attic, you encounter Constance Hatchaway, a spirit who's manifested using her old wedding dress. After passing by my best friend, you turn backwards and proceed down into the graveyard at an almost vertical angle. This, in my opinion, has always been the most relaxing part of any Disney attraction ever because you're essentially laying down in a dark building I mean, sure, you're surrounded by spirits, but I mean, you could totally take a nap in there. Who needs a mattress when you have curved black plastic? Am I right? Nobody? Okay, moving on. Now, your super comfy descent from the facade of the Haunted Mansion represents you falling or being thrown from a window in the attic. Now, the falling is pretty self-explanatory. You're terrified by Constance Hatchaway and the hatbox ghost that you stumble backwards out of the mansion and you fall into the graveyard. But being thrown, on the other hand, who throws you, and why? Is it the Hatbox Ghost? If so, what's his plan? He's always got that smile on his face. Now I've seen an innocent grin, and that, my friends, is not an innocent grin. Okay, sorry. Anyways, for one reason or another, we're thrown from the mansion and we land in the graveyard. It is here where this theory says we die. Or, instead of being thrown or falling, perhaps we jump, knowing the only way out of the mansion is to join the party you know, the, the ghost party, in the graveyard. The first animatronic we see in the graveyard, it's not a ghost, it is a living gravekeeper, and he looks at us, and he looks completely terrified, his poor knees can't take it anymore. And just look at that dog he has with him. That poor doggo. Somebody get him a treat! Why is this gravekeeper looking at us like we just jumped out of a window and became a ghost? You know, well, maybe we did, Mr. Gravekeeper. Did you ever think about that? It is from here on out through the rest of the attraction where the ghosts aren't trying to harass us or torment us anymore. They're partying, they're having a great time, and we are having a great time with them. That's why it took the ghost host such a long time to get back to us while we were going through the mansion. When he sees us again at the end of the graveyard scene, he says, Ah, there you are. He doesn't recognize us because we are also a spooky, scary ghost. After this, we pass the hitchhiking ghosts. 
ghosts that are well known for wanting to hitch a ride with other ghosts, wanting to follow them home so they can spread their influence of haunting. Now what does this theory mean? Is this all just a giant conspiracy theory cobbled together by Claude Coates, Yale Gracie, and Rolly Crump, created tricking us into thinking we were going through a family-friendly dark ride in a Disney park when in actuality we were confronting our own mortality? Probably not. Everybody, I, I have to come clean. I've been misleading you throughout a majority of this video. Now I know what you're thinking to yourself. Offhand Disney is a channel where I go for a reputable Disney source who is well researched and fact checked and who knows his Disney parks history. And now I'm not trying to toot my own horn here or anything, but you would be right. I am one of the best Disney channels on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you so much for thinking that, but I have misled you. Earlier in the video I said that we don't see spirits actually manifest until we get to the graveyard scene, and that's completely not true. We see a skeleton trying to break out of his cage, in addition to every single ghost we see in the ballroom scene, and not to mention Madame Leota. Not all of the spirits we see before the graveyard scene are disembodied. Some actually do show themselves. Also, we're not falling or being thrown out of the attic scene, we're actually supposed to be descending out of the attic scene. And how do I know that we're descending out of the attic scene? Well, I happen to have a book that was published by Disney about the story for the Haunted Mansion that we currently have in the mansion to this day, and it states, <clears throat> The attic shelters two strange ghosts, a bride whose heart glows red with each rhythmical beat, and a cloaked man whose head disappears from his body and glows hideously from within within a hat box. We make our escape through the dormer window and descend to the graveyard below. We descend to the graveyard below. Now I don't know about you, but that sounds a whole lot like you don't die, you just kind of descend or fall into the graveyard. If you do fall, you might like scrape your knees up a little bit, but you're not dead. But Dallin, you're probably saying, why does the gravedigger look so scared of us? Well, my dear audience, he's not afraid of us. He's actually afraid of the massive ghost party happening behind him. Perhaps he's afraid of the confirmation that there is some sort of afterlife. Maybe he's scared because he's up late and he doesn't need to party because he has to get up early the next morning, not feed his dog, and go to his working job that all of us normal people have. We can't party all the time, you ghosts! I'm sorry, that was oddly specific. What I'm saying is that this is nothing more than just a fun theory to tell your friends while you're riding the attraction and to point out all the different signs to them while you're actually riding it. It's very fun. Maybe, just maybe, I'll film a video on the Haunted Mansion when I'm at Disneyland next week and make a video comparing different spots I talked about in this video. I'll leave it up to you guys to decide though. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments below. Did you escape with your life? Or did the Haunted Mansion just earn its 1000th happy haunt? Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room, The Tiki Room, The Tropical Serenade, The Tiki Room Under New Management, The Tiki Room Featuring Stitch for some reason, you know, it has a lot of different names. But the Enchanted Tiki Room being an original Disneyland attraction has not only a lot of names, but also a lot of stories. And if you couldn't guess by the title, that's what I'm here to talk to you about today, the stories behind Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room at all the parks, or most of the parks. I might not talk about the Stitch one. And you may not know it, but this attraction has a very colorful history behind it, so I'm here to help peel back the layers of mystery and intrigue that cover up Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. What better way to start, though, than at the very beginning of the story? The Enchanted Tiki Room opened at Disneyland in 1963 and was the first attraction to feature audio animatronics, beating out Mr. Lincoln by a full two years. Or one year, if you count the New York World's Fair. Which, personally, I don't, because I uh, wasn't held at Disneyland. That would be cool though, can you imagine a World's Fair at Disneyland? Like, come on, no, okay, oh sorry, focus. But there was another attraction whose progress was impeded by the 1964 New York World's Fair. If you guessed Gene Lafitte, come on! Actually, I'm just kidding, it's, it's, it's just the Haunted Mansion. Now, if you know me, you know I love drawing crazy conspiracies between two different attractions, and what better attractions to connect than the Enchanted Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion? They say it can't be done, well, I'm going to try to do that today. Now you're saying, well, the Haunted Mansion and the Enchanted Tiki Room are two very different attractions, and that is where you are wrong, actually. They are more alike than you would think. Many Imagineers that we all know and love worked on not only the Haunted Mansion, but also the Enchanted Tiki Room almost at the same time. We're talking Rolly Crump, we're talking Mark Davis, we're talking Claude Coates, we're talking all the Imagineers who worked on some effects in the story for the Haunted Mansion also worked on the effects and story for the Tiki Room. It all 
comes together. But of course the same Imagineers would work on those two attractions, I mean that's literally their job to work on the attractions for Disneyland, but where are more connections? And I'm glad to say that there are plenty more connections between the Enchanted Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion. You know what, if we're gonna say the Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion are connected, why don't we just call it the Enchanted Creepy Room? Yeah? Yeah, that's a good one. Now, in case you guys were not aware, the Haunted Mansion is going to be a walkthrough with six or maybe seven rooms and a two or three minute presentation in each one before you moved on to the next. It would have been not unlike a series of short tiki room shows, except there's no birds, there's ghosts in this one. Now, if you know Rolly Crump, and I actually do know Rolly Crump, you know he was enamored with the idea of a weird, surreal house that was itself alive, like a bewitched castle in, uh, let's say, Beauty and the Beast. If you were to switch out magic tiki gods for ghosts, the tiki room is basically what you would have been seeing in the original concept for the Haunted Mansion. One reason why it feels so easy to substitute tiki gods for ghosts is that the Imagineers already did it for us. You know, after the tikis are playing their drums and it gets faster and faster and everybody starts looking around like, hey, is something going to happen? Something does happen. The lights go out and thunder flashes from outside. Kind of. You know, and that one bird says, <clears throat> the gods have been angered by all the celebrating. That's, uh, Michael. Michael's his name. You see, these fake thunderstorms outside the windows were a prominent element of Ken Anderson's 1957 or 58 plans for the Disneyland ghost house. And, well, they still kind of use it today in the changing portrait hallway, you know, where you're about to get on your doom buggy and there's the storm on your left side and the changing portraits on your right side? Yeah, that's, uh, more or less the same effect that they use in the Tiki Room. Now, I mentioned Beauty and the Beast earlier because Rolly Crump loved the Beauty and the Beast movie. Not the one you're probably thinking of. It's a lot older and it's in black and white and live action. Rolly talked about the living faces carved into the fireplace hearth in the Beast's castle in the old movie, and it's something he really wanted to recreate in the Haunted Mansion. And again, he kind of did recreate it in the Haunted Mansion with the negative impression busts that look at you as you walk past. But let's go deeper, let's look at this concept art for the stretching room, the original stretching room, and it looks pretty similar to what we have today, right? Let's take a closer look at those beams, though. Now, if these weird tiki-like faces were able to come to life and animate, it would be very reminiscent of that Beauty and the Beast black and white movie, but it would also be very reminiscent of something else elsewhere at Disneyland. Let's take a look at this Tiki Room poster, or I guess technically Tropical Serenade because that's what they called it in Orlando at the time. Oh, would you look at that! That Tiki's face looks a little familiar to me! If you really think about it though, most Tiki's are a little spooky in their appearance, and a little surreal and otherworldly, so it doesn't surprise us that they can kind of be caught up in the Haunted Mansion and Tiki Room at the same time. But, uh, what would you say if I were to show you another piece of concept art for something that was going to be in the Museum of the Weird? Basically an early concept for the Haunted Mansion, or a spin-off of the Haunted Mansion similar to the Blue Bayou. Yeah, that tree thing looks a little familiar. Kinda like Tangaroa outside the Enchanted Tiki Room. Coincidence? Maybe. Possibly. But, uh, let's go even further. And here we go, we're off to Theoryland. Once you start looking for visual similarities between the Haunted Mansion and the Tiki Room, you'll see them popping up everywhere. Another point of contact between the Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion is botanical in nature. It's the plants. Rolly really liked man-eating plants. Now, man-eating plants aren't something we see in abundance in the Haunted Mansion, but it's something we see during Haunted Mansion Holiday and something we see overseas over in Mystic Manor. The connection between the Haunted Mansion and the Enchanted Tiki Room is there, you just have to know where to look. Concept art most likely, but I mean it's still there. And that's not even to mention that the raven in the Haunted Mansion, you know the one that follows you throughout the mansion that was originally supposed to be the ghost host, is pretty much the same animatronic that you'd find inside the Tiki Room, it's built the same way as all the other birds. But now- In case you guys couldn't tell, I have a deep, deep, deep admiration for the Haunted Mansion. It's one of the most well-themed and memorable Disney attractions I've ever been on. Yeah, I'm gonna keep saying that, cause that's gonna be my excuse as to why I keep making videos on it, and why I'll never stop. One of the reasons the Haunted Mansion is my favorite Disney attraction to have ever been made is that there is a lack of a clean, cohesive, and clear story. Well, I shouldn't say clean and cohesive, because there is a story there. The reason I love it so much is it leaves so much to your imagination. Who is the ghost host? Why is this human groundskeeper and his dog the only alive animatronics in the entire attraction. Unless, of course, you count the raven. But is the raven really alive? Its eyes are glowing red. Is it supernatural? There's so many questions behind this attraction. There is a permeating question, though, one that Disney fans have had since the opening day of the attraction. 
Who owns the Haunted Mansion? Yeah, that's right, you heard me. Who's the deed holder of the Haunted Mansion? Who has final say over what happens on the property? Who is the owner of the house? Today, I'm aiming to answer that question. Or, you know, at least confuse us all a little bit more on the subject. So everybody, come along with me as we take yet another deep dive into the lore of the Haunted Mansion with Who Owns the Haunted Mansion? So of course when asking ourselves who owns the Haunted Mansion, we have to start back at the very beginning of the writing of the story of the Haunted Mansion. In 1957, Ken Anderson wrote his first creative treatment of the story of the Haunted Mansion, setting the attraction inside the manor of an old sea captain who, according to local legend, disappeared under mysterious circumstances many, many years earlier. This is where we will be starting our hunt for the original owner of the Haunted Mansion as we know it today. We'll be starting it with Captain Gore. This is a very popular and well-known origin to the Haunted Mansion. It gave us the Ghost Bride story we know today, Constance Hatchaway in some places, and still just the Black Widow Bride in the attic of other places. Well, I mean, heck, it even gave us the weather vane on top of the mansion in Disneyland. But keep in mind, this is not the story they ended up going with. This is not the story of any of the Haunted Mansions around the world. This is just an origin or starting point. You see, Captain Bartholomew Gore, or Captain Gideon Gore Lou, depending on what version of the story you're being told, killed his wife Priscilla after she found out he was a bloodthirsty pirate, which may or may not tie into Pirates of the Caribbean and Jean Lafitte. How did this bloodthirsty pirate kill his wife? Well, you know, as pirates do, he threw her down a well because, you know, he couldn't find an ocean to throw her in nearby. Walt enjoyed the first story idea, but he encouraged Ken Anderson to keep working and come up with another story for the Haunted Mansion, which, of course, he did, and this one was known as Bloodmere Manor. The history of the attraction, according to Ken Anderson's story, is that this is a lakeside estate of the unfortunate blood family. Our house had a tragic and bloody history of unlucky owners who died sudden and violent deaths, which resulted in their unhappy ghosts remaining behind to fulfill the uncompleted mission of their lives. Whatever that is, uh, who knows, I don't even think the story writers knew. We started the work of restoration as soon as it arrived at Disneyland, but strangely enough, the work of each day was destroyed during the night. It mysteriously remains always night within the house. So we recommend you stay close together during your visit and please, above all, obey your guide's instructions. This story even involved a Disneyland construction worker getting walled up inside the haunted house and then also becoming a ghost himself. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually kind of prefer the Captain Gore version of this story because it's less uh, morbid, I suppose. Well, I mean, it is a haunted mansion. It's supposed to be a little morbid, but I mean, a Disneyland construction worker getting walled up inside the haunted house and dying? I don't know about that one. So of course, Ken worked on another story beat. The third story Ken Anderson had written up for the Haunted Mansion included Walt Disney personally introducing the guests to the haunted house. Well, I mean, not personally, he wasn't in the haunted house, he was recorded on tape and on video, but I mean, he was there introducing you to the house. Your guide through the haunted house is quickly dispatched by a giant hairy arm, well, not Walt Disney by the way, this is another guide, and is replaced by a lonesome ghost guiding you through the attraction. Now the scenes in this version of the mansion are less spooky and accurate actually unsettling and more silly and prankish like the ones we get in the final version of the Haunted Mansion that we ended up with. Of course, as you could probably have guessed if you've ever ridden the Haunted Mansion before, this story didn't stick either. So far we have three separate owners of the Haunted Mansion, of which zero are canon to the current day Haunted Mansion story. Those are Captain Bartholomew Gore, the Blood Family, and of course Walt Disney himself. So I think it's safe to say that the past versions of the Haunted Mansion storylines are worth not looking into because they are past versions and not the current canon version. So let's look at the storyline that we have today. Now the modern day story we have in the Haunted Mansion, the canon one, is a sort of retirement home for spirits from all over the world. As evidenced by this sign that stood in front of the Haunted Mansion before it opened, and different media press tours and interviews that Walt Disney gave on the Disneyland TV show before it opened. This is why we can see different ghosts from all over the world in the graveyard scene, ghosts from Great Britain, ghosts from Egypt, ghosts from Norway, all different ghosts all coming together and having a great afterlife party. But who, I ask you, is the host of this party? the ghost host of this party. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry about that. Let's just, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Can we move on, please? Now let's start talking about this here ghost host. Let's see if he's actually the owner of the Haunted Mansion. 
He's not. Let's uh, Spoiler alert, he's not the owner of the Haunted Mansion, but let's talk about it. It seems to me that the ghost host is either A, a wandering person who got trapped in the Haunted Mansion and resorted to suicide as his way to get out. That's why he says, of course, there's always my way, showing his hanging body. Or B, he was one of the house staff or worked with one of the owners of the mansion and ended up killing himself in the attic for whatever reason. I think it's safe to say, though, that the ghost host is not the owner of the Haunted Mansion. He's not the master of the house, which leads me on to my next point, Master, Master Gracie. Is Master Gracie the owner of the Haunted Mansion? Again, spoiler alert, he's not. Now this is a very persistent and false rumor that spreads about the Haunted Mansion. Yale Gracie, an Imagineer who worked on the attraction, has a reference in the queue of the Haunted Mansion on a gravestone saying Master Gracie, blah, 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 he was put to rest here in the queue of the Haunted Mansion. Now lots of people interpreted this master title as being the master of the house, the owner of the Haunted Mansion, but this is indeed false. According to Imagineer Exitensio, who worked on the script for the Haunted Mansion as well as writing the lyrics for Grim Grinning Ghosts, the title of master on the tombstone was meant to imply a male too young to be called Mr not the master of the house. So there you have it, it's not Master Gracie, the owner of the Haunted Mansion, it's Mr. Gracie, someone who's a young boy and is too young to be called Mr. So that answers that. Master Gracie is not the owner. Man, it seems this search for an owner for the Haunted Mansion is gonna have no definitive answer. It seems like there's no canon to the Haunted Mansion story. There needs to be a book or something we can read, a, a children's storybook of the Haunted Mansion that we can read that gives us a definitive canon version of the Haunted Mansion story. Oh, hold on a second. Wait a second. There is a canon Haunted Mansion story that we can read. <coughs> it's a little dusty. Unfortunately, upon flipping through the book and looking for proof on the owner of the Haunted Mansion, I could find Nothing. Funnily enough though, the book does talk about someone in the attic scene that I think is worth mentioning. Not the Hatbox Ghost, we'll get to him later, but someone else in the attic scene. Someone you may know as Constance Hatchaway. Well, I guess everyone would know her as Constance Hatchaway, that's kind of her name. Uh, anyway, that's right everybody, today I stand before you and ask you to consider the following. The real owner of the Haunted Mansion is in fact Constance Hatchaway. Now, of course, I can't go around making crazy claims like this. I have to back it up with some sort of fact. I have to tell you why I think Constance is the owner of the Haunted Mansion. And I definitely will tell you that. I'll tell you that next week. That's right, everybody. This is not going to be just a one-part video. This is, in fact, going to be a two-part special on the owner of the Haunted Mansion. Surprise. I'm sorry. So if you're interested on finding out how I definitively found out that Constance is without a doubt maybe the owner of the Haunted Mansion, please be sure to tune in to Offhand Disney next week. Same time, same place, maybe. Probably not same time, same place. Definitely same place, probably not the same time. I'm rambling. Find out next week on Offhand Disney how Constance Hatchaway is without a doubt the owner of the Haunted Mansion in Who Owns the Haunted Mansion Part 2. We'll be dying to have you. <sighs> okay, we have uh, some, some sort of key. I don't know what door it would go to. And what else we have in here? Got some sort of uh, pennant, some necklace. It's, wait, is this? Are you sure about this? Funnily enough though, the book does talk about someone in the attic scene that I think is worth mentioning. Not the Hatbox Ghost, we'll get to him later, but someone else in the attic scene. Someone you may know as Constance Hatchaway. Well, I guess everyone would know her as Constance Hatchaway, that's kind of her name. Uh, anyway, that's right everybody, today I stand before you and ask you to consider the following. The real owner of the Haunted Mansion is in fact 
Constance Hatchaway. Now, of course, I can't go around making crazy claims like this. I have to back it up with some sort of fact. I have to tell you why I think Constance is the owner of the Haunted Mansion. And I definitely will tell you that. I'll tell you that next week. Oh, well, would you look at that? It's uh, next week already. Well, I guess I need to tell you now. A video two oh, one ish weeks in the making. Everybody, we're back with Who Owns the Haunted Mansion Part 2, the offhand Disney video everybody and their mother has been waiting for. Now before we get right into the ghosts and the spooks and the scary part of this video, let me just say if you guys have not seen Part 1 of the true owner of the Haunted Mansion, make sure to follow the first link down in the description below because this is actually Part 2 of a two-part series of uh, who owns the Haunted Mansion. So now with all that confusion out of the way, let's hop right into the deep lore of the Haunted Mansion. Last week I discussed some possible owners of the Haunted Mansion building, and I left off on one specific owner that you may not have thought about before. This character has a long and colorful history with the Haunted Mansion. Not just the building and the story of the Haunted Mansion, but also with the attraction itself. And no, I'm not talking about a certain pirate man. Today we're going to be talking about someone who had to scratch, claw, and perhaps decay capitate their way to the top, and by the end of their life became one of the 999 happy haunts that resided in the mansion. So today everybody, we're going to be talking about Constance Hatchaway and her connection to the true origin of the haunted mansion. Now, allow me to set the scene for you guys. The year is 1869 in California. Secret County, California, you know, to be a little bit more precise. A young and I'm assuming orphaned and penniless Constance Hatchaway wanders the streets of Secret County hoping to make a better life for herself someday. Now, Constance may be penniless, but she is beautiful. And just because she's beautiful doesn't mean she doesn't know how to rough some people up sometimes, if you get what I'm saying. After a young, wealthy farmer named Ambrose Harper saw Constance wandering around town, he took her in and started taking care of her. And of course, before the year was even over, the two were married. Though Constance decided that after that, she wasn't quite cut out for farm life. Now, Constance knew what she had to do in order to get herself a better life, even if that meant killing her own husband. And we all know what happened to Ambrose Harper. Constance moved across the United States and threw three more husbands before she finally came to the one that would change her life forever and his name was George Hightower. Now some of you out there may recognize the name George Hightower, and don't worry, I recognize it too. And don't you worry, we're gonna talk about it. Now before we talk about the Hightower family specifically, let's talk about George himself. George Hightower was an extremely wealthy man originating from an extremely wealthy family. At some point in between the years 1875 and 1877, he met a woman named Constance Hatchaway, who he would become engaged to and marry in 1877. At some point after their marriage, George was unfortunately murdered by his wife for his inheritance, either through beheading, a hatchet blow to the head, or a combination of the two. Now we all know George Hightower appears in the attic scene of the Haunted Mansion where his head disappears from his shoulders in his wedding portrait. But George also appears in another portrait in the Haunted Mansion, this one at the very beginning in the stretching room. That's right everybody, we're gonna do this theory today. In the stretching room, one of the portraits portrays an old woman sitting on top of a tombstone that says, rest in peace, dear beloved George. Now, if we look at George on the tombstone, we can see that not only does he have an axe in his head, but he also has that sweet, super large mustache that George Hightower has in his wedding portrait. Now, obviously, George and Constance wouldn't stay in California their whole lives, even if they are from California, because George Hightower is so rich. Why not the two of them retire to a very fancy antebellum-style mansion in New Orleans. And of course, everybody, what 19th century house isn't complete without a portrait of its owners, or its sole surviving last owner? What I'm saying, everybody, if you weren't following the story, is Constance married George Hightower, a very wealthy man who built an antebellum-style mansion in New Orleans, Louisiana, and the two moved there in their old age. After the mansion was finally completed, Constance did the deed and decapitated poor beloved George and became the sole owner of the Hightower Mansion. Hightower Mansion. H.M. Hmm. 
everything seems to be falling into place. Now because Constance and George didn't have any children or any close friends, when Constance passes away, the mansion falls to nobody. The mansion is simply let to rot there, becoming old and decrepit, becoming the perfect place for a retirement home of sorts for different spooks and ghosts from all over the world. And that, dear viewer, is where we, the park guests, come in we are invited into the mansion by the old groundskeeper, the ghost host. And because of Constance's terrible crimes committed during her life, she is forever cursed to inhabit her wedding dress which sits forever in the attic of Hightower Mansion. Over the years, the plaque sitting outside of the Hightower Mansion became rusty and old, and the house itself became sort of an urban legend amongst locals. Taking inspiration from the H and the M engraved on the plaque sitting outside of the Hightower Mansion, the locals began to call the house the Haunted Mansion. Mansion. Now of course this is just a theory and there are holes with every theory. Of course the ghost host refers to all the portraits as pictures of some of their guests as they appeared in their corruptible mortal state not some of their house owners. But everybody, there you have it. Through process of elimination, Constance Hatchaway is and was the last owner of the Haunted Mansion. Now for those of you who were extremely confused earlier in the video when I said Hightower was a very memorable name in the Disney parks, don't worry. Now if you've been to Tokyo Disney Sea, you probably already know what I'm going to be talking about. For those of you who haven't, let me introduce you to the Tower of Terror. Now, unlike our version of the Hollywood Tower Hotel here in America at Hollywood Studios, the Tower of Terror at Tokyo Disney Sea isn't themed after the Twilight Zone, nor is it themed after Guardians of the Galaxy, just in case you were wondering. No, instead, this version of the Tower of Terror features its very own original storyline that takes place at the Hotel High Tower. Wait a second. Now I don't know about you, but that name sounds a little familiar. Now this quote is from a 2006 press release regarding the opening of the attraction and the storyline that guests would be experiencing inside. Anyone who visits the American waterfront will soon find their gaze irresistibly drawn to the unique form of the lofty Hotel Hightower. The building's unusual design and extraordinary proportions were symbols of wealth and the power of its mysterious creator, antiquities collector, Harrison Hightower III, and indeed the stories of the man and the hotel are very much linked. After inheriting his father's mansion, Harrison Hightower III decided to renovate his home, adding gardens, a pool, and a spa, the five-story Caliph's Tower, the eight-story Indian Tower, and a ballroom. And finally, to top it all off, the 14-story Great Tower, in which Hightower kept his personal apartments in the penthouse suite. In 1899, Hightower embarked on the most hazardous expedition of his life, heading up the Congo River and into the dangerous parts of uncharted Africa. One day, Hightower's severely reduced party was chased into the area of the dreaded Mundutu tribe. Though greatly feared by neighboring tribes, the Mundutu welcomed Harrison Hightower's ill-fated expedition quite cordially and actually invited the adventurers to eat with them. During the meal, Harrison learned of the existence of the tribe's protective idol. The statue was called the Shiriki Unduntu, and Hightower wanted it for his own. He tried to persuade the village headman to sell him the idol, but was refused, which only served to increase his desire. He then told his men to prepare for battle, and grabbing the Shiriki Unduntu from its altar, stole the idol and escaped the village. Now for those of you who already know the story of the Tower of Terror in Tokyo, I'm gonna make this a little bit shorter. Basically, he stole the idol, takes it back to New York, and puts it in the Hotel Hightower. The Hotel Hightower then starts acting a little weird, the idol comes to life, curses the whole hotel, kills Harrison Hightower, and the hotel becomes haunted. So I guess the Hightower family has sort of a running history of hauntings. Everybody, Harrison Hightower in the Tokyo version of the Tower of Terror is indeed related and is probably the younger brother of George Hightower from the Haunted Mansion in Orlando and Anaheim. Harrison Hightower also makes a cameo appearance in the queue area of Hong Kong Disneyland's Mystic Manor, appearing in a group portrait with Henry Mystic and the rest of the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. This photo is dated to 1899 before his disappearance. This photo leads me to the granddaddy of all Disney theories. This theory revolves around Disney's very first secret society, the Society of Explorers and Adventurers, that spans all the parks across all the continents. But that, my friends, is a different video for a different day. So let me know down in those comments below, what did you think of this theory? Do you think it holds any ground? Do you think it's true? Do you think it's false? Let me know what you think and your own different Haunted Mansion theories. Who actually owns the Haunted Mansion down in the comments below? Just remember, your plan for retirement is good, but it's probably not as good as moving down to an antebellum mansion in Louisiana and taking care of those who actually need it. 
they have all retired. retired here to the haunted mansion. Actually, we have 999 happy haunts here, but there's room for a thousand. Any volunteers? Previously on Offhand Disney. But did you know that the normal Jungle Cruise at both Disneyland and Walt Disney World ties back into the society? There's also a water slide at Typhoon Lagoon that ties back into this massive story that Walt Disney Imagineering is trying to tell. There's even a bar slash lounge, I guess, at Disney Springs in Orlando that ties back into the society. And all of this I will explain in part three. So yes, Walt Disney's original Magic Kingdom does have some ties to the society. But let's stop and go back a second. Didn't you guys remember me talking about Jock Lindsay and his special associate? The two of them traveled throughout Florida for many, many years looking for the fabled Fountain of Youth. His associate was a very famous college professor who went by the name of Henry Jones Jr. That's right everyone, not only is Indiana Jones part of the Society of Explorers and Adventurers story, but he is also himself a member of the society. As some of you may have keenly spotted in the last episode, Professor Reed, the evil member of the society, responsible for stealing the Emerald Trinity, was a rival of Indiana Jones. And it was Indiana Jones himself who kicked Professor Reed out of the society. That means we've had an attraction referencing the Society of Explorers and Adventurers at Disneyland since 1995, the Temple of the Forbidden Eye. But the theory crafting doesn't stop there because if Indiana Jones is canon within the park storylines of the society, that means that the Indiana Jones movies are canon within the massive overarching story of the Disney parks. Within the same universe as the Indiana Jones movies, there is a Hatbox Ghost, there's a Haunted Mansion, there's a Jack Sparrow, and there are Pirates of the Caribbean. There are enchanted singing tikis and Space Station 77 floating out there somewhere in orbit in the future. And if there's even one reference to the society in the upcoming Jungle Cruise movie, then that would mean that those two movies, Indiana Jones and the Jungle Cruise, happen within the same universe. And all of this would mean Disney is crafting a cinematic and parks universe that would be intertwined story-wise, something that has never been done before and something that I eagerly await. So what about you guys? What do you think of this society turned theory video? Do you think I have a point or am I just reaching? I would love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments down below. So just just remember, whether you're in Frontierland, Fantasyland, New Orleans Square, or Adventureland, keep an eye open because there might be a massive story that's being told that you might not know even exists. One that may be on the big screen in just a few years. What do you mean look again? I already just- I just looked! The box is empty! All right, well, if it makes you happy, I'll look one more time. What the? Don't worry, buddy, I got you, I got you. <sighs> Finally, it was getting cramped in there. Were you in there the whole time? The idea of a Haunted Mansion style attraction went through many different incarnations. First as a walkthrough style haunted house attraction and then later on as a weird collection of antiquities from all over the world called the Museum of the Weird. Eventually Disney decided on a retirement home for ghosts from all over the world. Upon entering the queue, guests will find themselves in front of a massive antebellum style mansion with well tended gardens and courtyards. In the line, visitors will pass by a pet cemetery and a large number of graves containing funny plays on words. We then enter the haunted mansion through its front door. After this we enter a foyer with a very old mirror that doesn't really do its job very well anymore, and then we are loaded into the stretching room. After the sequence in the stretching room, guests are emptied out into a hallway full of changing portraits, and two busts that seem to follow you wherever you go. After we board our doom buggies and journey into the realm of the supernatural, we begin our tour of the mansion. We then pass by a moving suit of armor and a seemingly endless hallway with a floating candle 
candelabra further on down. Turning away from the endless hallway, we travel past a glass conservatory filled with dead, withered plants and flowers. In the middle of the room is a coffin occupied by a restless zombie calling for guests to help him out of the coffin. We then journey through the corridor of living doors, where several doors have come to life and begun knocking on themselves, snarling at us viciously, or sleeping. After passing by a grandfather clock chiming 13, we enter the seance room, where Madame Leota levitates above her seance table and calls in the spirits wherever they're at, and various fun musical effects happen in this room. Afterwards, we pass into the ballroom scene where we can see ghosts celebrating a birthday and just dancing around in circles, having just a jolly old time. After the ballroom scene, we then enter the attic scene, which is filled with pictures of men losing their heads to their bride, Constance Hatchaway. After coming face to face with Constance, we then meet the hatbox ghost, whose head disappears from between his shoulders and ends up in his hatbox that he's holding. After this, we descend into the graveyard scene below, where we see a gravekeeper and his very scared dog looking on at a ghost party. Yes, another one. After passing by the singing busts in the graveyard scene, we pay a visit to the hitchhiking ghosts. We then disembark our doom buggies and head on to a moving sidewalk which carries us past little Leota and then back into the park proper. And that, my friends, is Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. Now, let's compare and contrast with Walt Disney World's version of the Haunted Mansion. At Walt Disney World's Haunted Mansion, guests do not pass by a pet cemetery and funny plays on words on tombstones. Instead, they pass through a very unique interactive queue, with various different games and activities and fun little secret easter eggs for us to experiment with while we wait in line. Before we enter the mansion, we can also see the tombstone of Madame Leota, which sometimes comes to life and looks around. Instead of entering through the mansion's front door like at Disneyland, we instead go through a door in the side of the mansion, replacing the very very old and dusty mirror from Disneyland's version of the foyer is a portrait that belongs to Master Gracie, who seems to age and then decompose before our very eyes. The stretching room sequences themselves are very similar, except at Disneyland the floor is actually moving down, whereas at Walt Disney World the ceiling is moving up. At the Magic Kingdom there is also an effect to the ghost host's voice that makes it seem like he's flying around the room and changing his pitch and tempo that's not present at Disneyland. The candles in this room also seem to flicker a little more realistically than at Disneyland. Last but certainly not least, you can hear the wall creaking and groaning as it extends. After this, we exit into the loading zone and board our doom buggies. After beginning our journey, we pass through the Hall of Changing Portraits, the very same one that we would have walked past at Disneyland. This one does feature a few paintings that are not at Disneyland, though. After leaving the Hall of Changing Portraits, we enter the library, which is well stocked with the best ghost stories ever written. This scene is completely absent from the Disneyland version of the attraction attraction, but it does feature the busts that follow your eyes from the Disneyland attraction, except again, we're not walking past them, we're riding past them. After this, we pass by an invisible ghost playing the piano, which is sort of present in the Disneyland version, except this ghost is in the library, whereas the other ghost is in the attic. After this, we pass into yet another Magic Kingdom exclusive scene, the Grand Staircase. Moving on from the staircase, we pass creatures in the wall that eventually become the wallpaper itself. As we move on to basically the same thing from Disneyland, the hallway, with the endless hallway, the moving set of armor, the zombie in the coffin trying to escape, and the corridor of doors. We then enter the seance room, which is very similar to Disneyland's except there are a few different lighting effects added to make it look a little spookier. We then enter the ballroom scene, which again is very similar to Disneyland's but features a different organ. The Disneyland organ is very special, the Disney fans out there know why. The attic scene differs from the one at Disneyland because it does not feature the ghostly man playing the piano, and the hatbox ghost is completely absent. The graveyard scene remains mostly unchanged from Disneyland's version, except the lighting in this version is a little better. The hitchhiking ghosts, on the other hand, have completely updated animatronics, and instead of actually having a physical hitchhiking ghost riding alongside you in your doom buggy, it's just a video screen that plays in front of you. And from here, instead of exiting your doom buggy and walking past little Leota, you ride past her in your doom buggy and then disappear bark. The Haunted Mansion at Walt Disney World does feature a number of different and additional scenes, like the library and the Grand Staircase. There are also tiny little additions that they don't feature in the Disneyland Mansion, like the creatures in the wall turning into the wallpaper, or the new and updated Hitchhiking Ghost animatronics. But the Disneyland version does feature the Hatbox Ghost in the attic, which is a very nice feature that Walt Disney World cannot lay claim to. The Walt Disney World version of the attraction, though, is a bit longer and a bit more polished. 
polished, with better lighting techniques used, and some new effects thrown in here and there to help boost your immersion. While Disney World's also does feature the interactive queue, which can help reduce the feeling of waiting so long in line, and even adds a bit to the story. So what do you guys think? What is your favorite version of the Haunted Mansion in the American parks? Make sure to comment down below and let me know so I can tally up all the votes and I will let you know in the next episode of Ride vs. Ride which one you guys think is better. And keep in mind that I'm sort of still learning how to do this project the best way to do this series, so let me know down in the comments if you liked this and you want to see more Ride vs. Ride and what I could do better. As always everybody, thank you so much for watching, I will see you all in the next video, goodbye. Creepy, spooky, scary, disturbing, unnerving, uh, other, and other synonyms are the best way to describe the way Phantom Manor makes me feel. Of course, I've never actually been on Phantom Manor in my life unfortunately, but they did update it recently with a brand new storyline, new special effects, and new English narration, which is good for people like me who don't really speak French. In today's video, we are going to examine the new story behind Phantom Manor, what changed, what remained the same, how the new Phantom Manor relates to the Haunted Mansion or Mystic Manor, or the rest of the Disney Parks universe. From Vincent Price returning as the ghost host, to the identity of the Phantom finally being revealed for the very first time officially, I'm here today to help you uncover the real story behind Phantom Manor. Friends of the channel may already know the story behind the original Phantom Manor, but for those of you who don't, let's go through it again just really quick. Henry Ravenswood moved out to the west with the idea and dream of finding gold in them there hills. Eventually he stumbled upon a sacred Native American mountain called Big Thunder Mountain. Henry Ravenswood, not caring too much about the natives, decided to start mining in this mountain and eventually discovered gold. Now being extremely filthy, stinking rich, using his newfound fortune, he founded the Big Thunder Mining company. And the level of mining at the sacred Big Thunder Mountain went from about a 1 or a 2 to a solid 15 overnight. And of course, if you employ miners, you have to have somewhere for them to live, so he founded the city of Thunder Mesa. That is Frontierland as a whole. The entire Frontierland land? That's Thunder Mesa. And Mr. Ravenswood having what we like to call screw you money built the biggest house you've ever seen on top of the tallest hill in Thunder Mesa. The hill this manor was built on was called Boot Hill, and the manor was of course called Phantom I mean, the uh, Ravenswood Manor. Not too many ghosts at this point to call it Phantom Manor. There, he married a woman named Martha, and together they had a child named Melanie. Melanie would go on to become a tragic character in her later life. Over time, Melanie grew up into a beautiful young woman and fell in love with a train conductor from Thunder Mesa. Eventually, much to Henry's dismay, they became engaged and were ready to get married in Ravenswood Manor. All while this was happening, the gold in Big Thunder Mountain was drying up rapidly, and Boot Hill and the rest of Thunder Mesa were going from more of a boom town to a ghost town. The town's fate was sealed in 1860 when a massive earthquake hit Thunder Mesa and killed Henry Ravenswood, his entire family, and most inhabitants of the town were either gone or, you know, uh... Let's just say they'd find a new house to move into very shortly. Shortly after the earthquake on Melanie's wedding day, kind of weird they decided to just go ahead with the wedding even though everybody's either dead or missing. But hey, if you find a wedding date and you sent out those cards already, you gotta stick to it, so don't really blame her. While Melanie was getting ready for her wedding, a mysterious phantom appeared at the manor and lured her groom into the attic where he hanged him by the neck from the rafters. Yeah, kind of like the original mansion. It's pretty hardcore too, the phantom's just holding the noose with the guy in it. It's pretty graphic, but you know, kids ride Disney, happy. And I'm sure you can infer the rest of the story. Melanie was horrified and sad that her husband didn't show up to the wedding, she wandered the house for all time and eternity and the Phantom invited all of his grim, grinning, ghostly friends to haunt the manor. And that, everyone, is the old story of the attraction. The new one is very similar but features a few more plot points that are important to telling the story. So now I'm going to talk about what they added to the story, what's new with the reopening of Phantom Manor. In this new continuity, Melanie doesn't fall for the train engineer right away. Instead, she dates a few other guys before settling on the train engineer. I mean, not settling, he was probably a nice guy, but I guess her dad thought she could do better. She dated four different men, to be precise. One was a wealthy oil magnate, who I'm sure her dad would have approved of, if he hadn't been mauled to death by a bear. Another was a wealthy sailor, who sailed right over the edge of a roaring waterfall, so yeah, I guess he's out. One was the owner of a sawmill, and you can kind of infer if you're the owner of a sawmill,
jail and you meet a gruesome death, you can see what happened. The fourth and last man that she dated was probably her dad's favorite because he worked for the Big Thunder Mining Company right there in Thunder Mesa. He was a very rich executive in the company, but if you see a pattern, he didn't quite make it because he got blown to smithereens by TNT while in a mine. So, uh, Melanie's track record not looking too good here. Lots of respect to the railroad engineer though for being brave enough to date her since her four past boyfriends, you know, died horribly. When Melanie finally got engaged to the train engineer, he promised to take her far away from the dwindling town of Thunder Mesa, and her dad didn't appreciate that very much. Something funny about her four previous boyfriends that I forgot to mention is that their names corresponded with the ways they died. Barry Claude was mauled to death by a bear, Sawyer Bottom was sawed in half at his sawmill, Captain Rowan D. Falls rode his tiny boat off the edge of a steep waterfall, and Ignatius Knight stood atop a stack of dynamite boxes with a lit fuse, and needless to say, it was a closed casket funeral. Was that too dark? Nah, no, that's fine, that's staying in. It is after we exit the stretching room we enter the new updated Hall of Portraits, which answers a question guests have been asking for many, many years. A portrait of Henry Ravenswood himself hangs on the wall, and when the lightning flashes, his face changes to that of the Phantom. It was long suspected that Henry Ravenswood was the Phantom in the original Phantom Manor, but there was no official canon explanation as to who or what the Phantom was. Was it a dead Henry Ravenswood returned from the grave to get revenge on his own daughter? Henry Ravenswood, who was alive, faked his own death and hid in a phantom disguise and sabotaged his daughter's wedding and, you know, the rest of her life? Or was the phantom a completely unrelated malevolent spirit summoned by the Thunderbird inside Big Thunder Mountain? Oh yeah, there's a Thunderbird. A Native American spirit that caused the earthquake in Thunder Mesa after the mining in Big Thunder Mountain really got out of control. But the new updated Phantom Manor tells us that for sure, 100% that the Phantom is a Henry Ravenswood returned from the dead to get revenge on his daughter. I mean, geez, coming back from the dead to make sure your daughter doesn't get married to a guy you don't like? I mean, talk about helicopter parenting, guys, am I right? Another new addition to Phantom Manor are the portraits of Melanie's previous four boyfriends in the conservatory. You know where the skeleton's trying to get out of the coffin in the original Haunted Mansion? Yeah, apparently Henry Ravenswood was nice enough to have those guys' funerals there all at the same time. You know what? I'm just not gonna ask any questions here. I also wanted to quickly mention that Madame Leota makes an appearance in this ride, and I'm not quite sure why or where she fits into the story. Maybe Leota was sitting in her seance room in New Orleans Square at Disneyland and heard that there was a brand new swing and haunted mansion opened across the entire world, so she packed her bags and went to see this new Phantom Manor. Either that or they just wanted to include a classic scene from the Haunted Mansion, I, I'm thinking too much about this. Instead of a graveyard scene like in the Haunted Mansion in the States, they have a Phantom Canyon scene. This is where Grim Grinning Ghosts plays, and the tone is overall a little bit lighter. In the previous Phantom Manor, this town was occupied both by the spirits of those killed in the earthquake and regular townspeople from Thunder Mesa. In the new updated Phantom Canyon scene, all of the animatronics and people are meant to represent those who died in the earthquake. Forever doomed to haunt Phantom Canyon, and Phantom Manor for that matter. As guests encounter the Phantom again and then escape the Phantom, uh, again, they encounter a crypt full of Melanie's dead boyfriends. Barry Claude's crypt is open and his skeletal arm reaches out at guests holding a wedding ring. Sorry Barry Claude, your last name is very appropriate as I am spoken for. Serving as a replacement for the hitchhiking ghost scene in the Haunted Mansion, we can hear Melanie's voice voiced asking guests to marry her. Again, what is it with undead spirits trying to marry me? I'm on vacation, I just want to enjoy myself. Then we exit the ride by passing by Henry's prized wine cellar, which is, as you probably could have guessed, haunted, and we can hear the voice of someone calling for us to hurry back. So, everybody, what did we learn from the brand new incarnation of Phantom Manor? Well, we learned that Melanie Ravenswood dated four men before she decided on marrying the railroad engineer from the original story. We also learned that these suitors are very persistent, and not even death will keep them from trying to marry someone, so um, good for them. It was also confirmed that Henry Ravenswood was and is the Phantom in this new story. It was confirmed that this is his ghost, and he did return from the dead and try to haunt his daughter. He's really just a bad dad. Vincent Price, the master of horror, returned to do the voice of the ghost host. Price also provided the voice of the Phantom in the attraction, mostly just laughing. But if Vincent Price is both the ghost host in the stretching room and the Phantom, we can safely assume that the ghost host is the Phantom. They're just the same person. And last but not least, the earthquake in this new incarnation of Phantom Manor did a lot more damage than it did in the original. Whereas Thunder Mesa was already drying out and dying by the time the earthquake hit in the original Phantom Manor, in this one there are a 
lot more dead people in Phantom Canyon. So that can only lead me to assume that the town was a lot more busy and bustling during the time of the earthquake in this new storyline. And of course, in both the old and new version of Phantom Manor, we learn that Madame Leota has a very big affinity for traveling. I mean, that's fair, she probably doesn't have to buy a ticket, she can probably just ship herself to these places. So, good for her. So what do you guys think about the new story of Phantom Manor in Disneyland Paris? Do you prefer the old one, or do you like the expanded lore that the new one gave us? And are there any pieces of the story I forgot to include in this video? Most likely, yes. <laughs> so let me know down in those comments below if I missed anything. Listen, man, I can't explain it. That box just showed up here one day, started talking in these weird, weird words, and they've been showing me things related to the Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean, and there's a weird marking on the front. Looks like some sort of flag. I, I don't know whose flag it would be or what kind of flag it is, but there's a flag for sure on the front. What do you think about that? You have no idea whose flag it might be. No, I have no idea. Have I ever talked about a pirate before? Disneyland is often known as the happiest place on Earth, and 364 days out of the year, that's correct. But for one, or two, I guess, special nights this year, Walt Disney's original Magic Kingdom took on a more sinister tone. If you love Disney and hate sleep, boy, do I have the special event for you. 50 years ago, one of the most memorable attractions Disney has ever made opened its doors to the public for the very first time. The exterior of the ride was finished in 1963, but the ride itself would not open until six years later in 1969. So the facade sat there for six years, beckoning guests towards its gates and then telling them, eh, the mansion's not quite finished yet. And then, on the 9th of August of 1969, the mansion would open its gates to the public for the very first time. And then exactly 50 years to the day, I showed up. And me personally, I plan on riding the Haunted Mansion during its 50th birthday 13 times. Maybe not in a row, I do want to experience everything they have to offer, but I will be riding the Haunted Mansion 13 times for its 50th anniversary. So I'll keep a counter going in the bottom of the screen so you can keep a tally with me as we move through the night. Heed my request. Our spooky 
celebration has been 50 years in its cremation. Let's all shiver and shake to the smell of the wind. most of Adventureland, uh, all of Critter Country except for Splash Mountain and Winnie the Pooh, the land is open, can't ride any rides, and all of New Orleans Square is open for tonight. Frontierland, also, all open. So, I feel like we need to go ride our Haunted Mansion for the first time tonight. Number one of 13, obviously. So, let's head over back, we're in Frontierland now, let's go back towards New Orleans Square and see if we can't visit one of the 900 and 99 happy haunts because there's people outside the mansion right now of course during this event the mansion was extra spooky with lights and different effects going that aren't normally happening in the haunted mansion during the day notice the fog coming over the top of the haunted mansion and the outside does look amazing but it's something on the inside that i really wanted to talk to you about today hands arms feet and legs inside and watch your children please 
para su seguridad, permanezca sentado y mantenga las manos, brazos, pies y piernas dentro de mí. Y cuide a los pequeñitos y ahora prepárese. We find it delightfully unlivable here in this ghostly retreat. Every room has more and more creeps. If you couldn't catch it because my camera was out of focus, those are live actors inside the Haunted Mansion. This one, in this case, dressed up as a knight. This marks the return of the Haunted Mansion live character actors. This is the first time in years that they've done this. The knight is back, but there's not just the knight in the mansion, so let's keep watching. That's right, there's another living ghost having a nice birthday meal with all the other ghosts sitting at the table. Again, it's not the last living ghost we'll come across, there's one more in the mansion, and if you listen really closely you can hear me freaking out about how cool this is. Big fan, big fan. I love your work. Yes, if you didn't catch that, that's Gus, sitting there at the end of the Haunted Mansion ready to see you off. But the knight had so much more to offer, not just riding the Haunted Mansion 13 times in a row. Obviously, because, you know, I wasn't able to do it, there was so much to do. I got to see Madame Leota summon some spirits, she was pretty cool. And now, dear mere mortal. Please direct your attention to the balcony, for this is a once-in-an-after-lifetime occasion, and we invite you to attune your senses as our head spiritualist, Madame Leota, communicates with regions beyond. So that was Madame Leota's summoning ritual. She didn't summon it in anything but a bunch of sounds, but either way, we summoned some ghosts. But now let's go somewhere else in the park. Somewhere, believe it or not, even creepier than the Haunted Mansion. 
so it may look empty, but there's quite a few people here. But it is empty up in the trees, in Tarzan's trees house, to be precise. And that's exactly where I'm going because the brochure said it would be open. Let's see if it is. And it is, we can go in. Come with me up the tree house, everyone. Odds are we're not gonna find a whole lot of other people up here. Now I'm not sure if this is a haunted treehouse or if this treehouse is not haunted. I don't even know if you guys can see me right now. It's very dark and very spooky and very grim up here. So let's uh let's stay on the lookout for any creepy creeps that might be up here. It's pitch black. That's right everyone, Adventureland was open during this event, Tarzan's Treehouse and Indiana Jones, and in Tarzan's Treehouse, all of the lights were turned off. So if you listen, you can hear me losing my mind in a very dark and very empty Tarzan's Treehouse. The audio is still playing, very happy, friendly, strangers like me, it's all still playing, but all of the lights that you can't see here are off. So, oh I have my Haunted Mansion shoes on by the way. Take a look at those. Pretty neat. But yeah, I'm not a massive fan of walkthrough haunted houses. I'm always scared something's going to leap out at me. But I think we're relatively safe up here in Tarzan's Treehouse. At least I hope we would be. We are literally the only people up here. You guys, obviously, <laughs> it's very dark, very foreboding. I'm just going to stop talking and let you guys enjoy the experience. During the event, Disney had the fog machines turned up to 11. The entire Rivers of America, New Orleans Square waterfront area was completely covered in fog to give you a very spooky feeling in the spooky atmosphere for the spookiest anniversary of the spookiest Disney ride. <laughs> This atmosphere is insane. at this point where I took my second voyage to the afterlife on the haunted mansion for the night. The second out of three. strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls. Whenever candlelights flicker, where the air is deadly still, that is the time when ghosts are present, practicing their terror with ghoulish delight. And for those curious, it wouldn't be a Disney special event without special food offerings. And that's exactly what I'm showing you here. And you guys know me, of course I had to grab a Midnight Mint Julep. It's blackberry flavored with a lychee berry in it. I had never had a lychee berry or lychee berry before in my life, but it was delicious. And now one more event before we finish up the night.
it is from here where I decided to end the night with one last ride on the Haunted Mansion. I tried to be one of the last people riding it for the night, and hey, I succeeded. I shared the last few Doom Buggies of the night with Fresh Baked Disney, so if you want to see the night from their perspective, it's probably better coverage than I could ever provide here, go check it out. But for now, enjoy. begins here in this gallery, where you see paintings of some of our guests as they appeared in their corruptible mortal state. The 50th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion! Woo! Woo! Thank you all so much for coming here this evening. Yeah. And now, I'd like to ask that all of you step away from the walls toward the dead center of the room. So may I introduce the Titan of Terra, the host with the most. Your cadaverous pallor betrays an aura of foreboding. Mm -hmm. And consider this dismaying observation. This chamber has no windows and no door. Of course, there's always my way.
podcast. Thank you for 50 years. empty the main street with this kind of music playing. Fresh baked. Oh, I'm here with fresh baked too. Also. This is for the this is the time when all the professional photographers are laying down in the street getting totally. rich. Yes. <laughs> And since it showed up, you know, I just left it right there because I don't want to move it. It's talking. You want to move a talking box that's telling you to open it and it has mysterious compartments inside? Why would you want to move that? That thing's, that thing's evil. You have a key and a necklace from some of Disney's best rides tying them together. Open it one more time. See what you get. Okay, uh, here it goes. Uh-oh.